You know, I grew up around North Belfast here and got into trouble at Young Boys Down and we used to around here because there's a lot of sectarianism and you get into all those sort of troubles as well with the, the kids fighting in the streets and that. But I went to the Gospel Hall down the road, the Sunday school, and I went to BB and I went to Presbyterian Church. My mum wanted to get us out and as I got older, I went on my way. And as I got older, my dad put me into boxing and into sport to try and keep me off the streets. And I'd done that for a lot of years. And I went from there and I went on into kickboxing and I went from there and, and I excelled at the sport. I don't want to talk about it, the glorify and the sport. But I excelled very well at the sport to the point where at my level, I couldn't go any higher. And so I ended up, I took up weight training, which went to bodybuilding, which went, I started injecting drugs. And I got a, such a size, I got a job in a nightclub door. And all things were going for me. Nightclub door men have got it made, so you think. I remember standing at the, at the door, the world was my oyster, and somebody offered me drugs. Oh, I wouldn't take those sort of things, and I was definite no-no for those. I was against them. Yet I would have injected an inch and a half needles with that full of anabolic steroid. And after a while, I was on a bus run, and I took the drug just once. That's what I thought. I'll do it just once because I am the only person that on the bus that's taken these drugs. I was the only one that told me who wasn't taking the drug that night. And we were going to a nightclub where you had to be on drugs to appreciate it. And I says, well, I'll do it once. I'm in control. Once won't hurt me and I'll be able to handle this. And I took the drug, but really I didn't. The drug took me. Took me further than I ever wanted to go. I caught hold of me and next week sure I'll do it one more time because I enjoyed it. I hadn't come across a bad time yet, but they come. And I enjoyed it and I thought, well, one more time. Took it again. And the Saturday night went to a Friday and a Saturday night. To a Friday, a Saturday night and a Sunday night. So it completely took over my life. And I either had to drink or take drugs every single night or day of the week. And through my sin, through my habits, I had a house repossessed on me. I lost another home through lack of payment because I was trying to get money for drugs. Went from there, I lost everything that I had and at the end I had a half a bin liner full of clothes and one suit sitting in my mother's wardrobe. And that's where drugs brought me, but it also brought me in myself, it brought me to depression. And everybody coming off drugs is, you take what's known as a downer. But when you take more, the downer gets harder and gets slower and gets deeper. And I got such the depth that I couldn't climb out again. I was in a horrible pit. Such a horrible pit that I felt within myself that there was no hope left. To me, there was no life worth living for. I had no life anymore. And I thought, the only way I'm going to get out of this is either to ride the storm and to go through this and battle through it or else somebody needed to flick a switch like a light going on or off. So I went to the doctors and I was bleeding by this time inside. And the doctor told me, he says, you're killing yourself. Your insides are rotting away. You better stop this. Not only if you take one wrong drug can it kill you, but you're really eating up your insides. And alcohol then was getting more and more. So basically I became addicted to both. And I came to the point where I went to drug counselors and they threw their hands in the air. The doctors couldn't help me and the drug counselors couldn't help me. And I tried to run, I tried to get away. And no matter where I ran, it caught up with me. No matter where I went, it was always there. No matter what I'd done, I couldn't get rid of this. And the depression within me got lower to the extent that I stood at a window ledge, looking down at the roof of a lorry with voices in my head. Go ahead, jump, looking for the switch. There's your switch. Once you hit the ground, you're dead. No, you don't need to worry about this anymore. I was totally demented in my head, hearing voices, seeing shadows going up the walls. See my bedroom wardrobe turning into a coffin when I had a house. Seen many things, people turning the demons before me. And these things were really driving me mad. And I remember sat on the window ledge and there's your switch, go ahead, jump, and it'll be all over. But a voice in my head says to me, What about your mother? What about your father? What about your family? It's not fair in them. That's an easy way for you, it's not fair in them. And then all of a sudden I got the thought, where will you be when you die? Where will you go to? 
I remember stepping back off the window ledge and falling on the floor and I didn't know to call the Lord, the Lord Jesus or anything. And all I could think of was, and I cried it loud and cried from my heart, I says, God, will you help me? God, if you're real, if you're there, will you help me? I can't do anything here. Nobody can help me. I'm beat. And I wanted everything to come together and be fine and my life to be fine. But I wanted it my way. And I didn't realize it was his way, not my way. I didn't realize that I had to come God's way, not Ken's way. So my life went on, it got worse and worse. I was in the horrible pit. I was in the Mary clay, I was stuck, couldn't get out of it. I remember I went and I was out one night with my brother and we we're walking up. I was going to stay in a friend's house and we we're walking up and he was going home. And it was, I'd been drinking and taking drugs, full stuff from a Friday and this was a Sunday, early hours of Sunday morning. I remember turning around and saying to him, listen, don't waste your life. Don't do what I've done. You have still time. You can pull back from here. I can't, I'm finished. And to me, my life was over. And to me, I had nothing left to give. And to me, I had tried so hard and I had fought so long that my fight wasn't strong enough in me anymore. And that was the last night of my life to me. That night when I went, in my mind, I was going to flick the switch myself. That was it. And I can remember him saying, what are you talking like that for? Are you okay? And I said, look, please don't wreck your life like I've done. And I walked away. You see, I took paranoid attacks because the drugs make you go like that. And I went from being known as a, a sportsman and, and quite successful at it to a drug addict. Do you down and out? Do you nobody? I remember walking into the park before that and this some fella says to me one time, and I taught him in the boxing club. He came walking along and he called him Ronnie. And I remember Stephen was with me and it was a Sunday and I had a big carry out. And I says, what do you think God, Ronnie? He's bringing me in for a drink. He says, no. He says, I know who's bringing who for a drink. And he pointed at me and says, Ken, I think it's the other way around. And that hit me so hard that someone that I taught when he was younger even knew what I was like now compared to what I was in his eyes then. So that night I went home and I felt I had nothing left. My life was over. Everything was finished from now on. I'm going to go home. And it's going to be finished. Or go to this friend's house and it would be finished. And the next thing I remember, I woke up on the floor. I can't remember any. I don't remember a thing. I don't remember taking another step. I don't remember talking to anybody. And I, I woke up and my face was blown out. And I like two slits in my eyes for my eyes. And there's two Christians standing looking at me and they said, you're coming to church with us. We've been praying for you and you told us. I can't remember telling anybody. And I went, the usual sort of language and telling them I'm not going. And they persevered and went down to my mum's and got my suit out of my wardrobe and I went. I went to Whitewell. And as I walked in the door, I remember putting my foot in the door and something gripped me. And I says, I can't go in there. And the Tudor Lodge was open at the time and I says, I'll go over here to the bar, sure, I'll see you later. And they called me and called me and pulled at me and they brought me in and I sat down with them and that night, I'll never forget it, Post McConnell's word was this, obstacles that God puts in your way to stop you going to hell. Obstacles that God puts in your way to stop you going to hell. Well, that rocked me. Rocked me to the core because I always thought the devil put obstacles in my way to stop me going to heaven. I said, no, the devil doesn't want me to go to heaven. And I realized that night, no. That God loved me so much that he would put obstacles in my way to stop me going to hell. And it hit me to the point, I says, Lord, God, you love me that much that you would put an obstacle in my way to stop me going to hell. It's not the devil putting obstacles in my way to stop me going to heaven at all. You love me that much. And as he went through the obstacles, it was people talking to you about the Lord Jesus, people on you a track, people asking you to church, passing an open door, going to church and hearing the gospel and walking out the same way you came in. People witnessing to you when you're walking through the town. Hearing someone's testimony like, this is, I'm an obstacle tonight. 
And he says, you have swerved round these obstacles. And as he was preaching these, the Holy Spirit was bringing photographic evidence to my mind. And it was all coming up like photographs. People who had spoke to me when I was drunk and high out of my head that I didn't even remember. People that I worked with who had asked me to church and people who had witnessed to me and, and they were just coming before me. I've been there and I've been around that obstacle and I've been there and I've been there. In other words, I've had chance after chance after chance after chance time and time and time again and I've swerved around every one of them. That's what he says. You have swerved around these obstacles. But this is what he says. He says, tonight, tonight you're at the cross. Tonight, it was as if he was inside my mind looking out. He says, you see Christ. And at that moment, I seen him high and lifted up. And I seen the Lord Jesus dying for me. This great obstacle to stop me going to hell. This great obstacle to stop me going to hell. And I'm saying that reverently about my Lord. He says, go by the cross tonight. And you could go out those doors to a lost eternity. That rocked me to such. He threw the net out and he, you know, he makes an appeal. I have a shepherd. Have you? I have a shepherd, sir. Have you? I have a shepherd, lady. Have you? Is there a man here tonight? Is there a woman here tonight? A young man, a young woman, a boy, a girl. <coughs> A mom, a dad, and the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you. And you see your need of Christ tonight and what Christ has done for you at the place called Calvary. And while every head is bowed tonight, every eye is closed, and there's no one watching, only myself, is there a man in this house tonight who will say, yes, pastor, will you pray for me? I want to get right with God. If there's a man here, if there's a woman here, and God is speaking to you, would you have the courage and the humility to lift up your hand and take it down again? We will see it and pray for you. Thank you, lady. I see your hand. Is there another one tonight? There's another one over there. God bless you, sir. You may take your hand down. And you too, sir. You may take your hand down. During the appeal, my hand went up and voices in my head, you're stupid. What did you do that for? You'll not be able to keep this. You, you'll not be able to do that. You'll not be able to be a Christian. You don't even want to be a Christian. How are you going to tell your friends? How are you going to tell your family? What are you going to say to them? You'll never be able to do this. And this is all I can explain what happened to me. When I said the sinner's prayer, I said, God, I didn't know to say, Lord. I says, God, I haven't got anything. I haven't a home to offer you to open. And I haven't anything even financial ways. And I've got a body that's bleeding at the minute and it's wrecked. I've got a spirit that's so down with depression it can hardly stand itself. But see what I've got? I can't come any other way, but I'll give you this if you take it. Doctors can't flick a switch for me. Neither can a drug counsellor. Neither can family or friends. And I certainly can't. My life's over. Last night my life was over. How am I here? Why am I here? I was finished last night, Lord, but yet I'm here. He says, if you can take this and do anything with it, it's yours. And this is what happened to me, and this is the truth. I felt a heat from head to toe burning through me. It was like someone taking a cloth and wringing it out, and the water ran from head long, quite long hair, stuck to my head. The water dripped off my earlobes, off my nose, ran down, soaked through my shirt, right through the very suit. And I started shaking from head to toe, and I stood up, and when I stood up, as soon as I stood up, I couldn't, felt I couldn't stand it. I started crying. And that night, I was walking out the door and I heard the voice of Pastor McConnell in my ear, in my head. Walk out those doors tonight. You go by the cross and you'll go to a lost eternity. And I got the door and in my heart, I knew I was different. I knew I'd been touched by God. I knew I was saved. And in my heart, I says, not tonight, I won't. Hallelujah. Not tonight. And the weight of my sin was off me physically, off my shoulders. And I walked out, and from that day, he sat my feet upon a rock. 
and he established my goings. <clears throat> He's put a new song in my mouth. This is the new song. This is the song I sing to my Lord. Put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. The blood purchased you and God took you. It's just your mind. Your mind. Thou art the sinner's friend. So I thy friendship claim. A sinner saved by grace. When thy sweet message came, you're mine, mine, mine. I know thou art mine, Savior, dear Savior. I know thou art mine. My hardened heart was touched. Thy pardoning voice I heard. And joy and peace came in. Whilst listening to thy you're mine, mine, mine. I know thou art mine. Savior, dear Savior, I know who thou art mine. So let me sing thy praise. So personal. The blood of Jesus Christ was not only uh, sung about, it was preached with unction, with power, and with conviction, and with determination from the lips of every preacher that ever graced a pulpit that were worth their salt. And notice when we look at the blood, the precious blood of Christ, when I look at the blood, I look in amazement at the wonder of it all. I look at the glory of it all, and I am in awe of it all. When I behold the cross of Christ and all that he has done for me, when I behold the wounds in his hands and his feet and his riven side, the glory of what he has done through the gory is the glory where Christ has shed his blood for us. That blood, this particular blood, is the only blood that's able to cleanse. Not animals, not bulls, not goats, not lambs, not mass. This blood, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It alone can cleanse the most vilest of sinners from their sin. It alone is able to free the soul from the grip of death and darkness. It alone is able to save and to redeem the lost and bring them into the fold of God. It alone is able to avert the wrath of God who will judge all with his righteous judgment and will without doubt meet out that judgment with woeful wrath against a Christ-rejecting sinner. That's very solemn. The Christ-rejecter will stand before God. The man and woman outside of Christ will stand before God as their judge. The man and woman not saved, not born again. The man and woman who have never been by faith to the cross of Calvary, Golgotha to that tree, and claim the blood for themselves, for their own soul will find themselves standing before a holy God, and they will be judged according to to all that they have rejected. Notice the wonder, the glory, and the amazement of it is this, that I, me, that I might be saved through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
that I might be redeemed, that I might be forgiven, that I might be cleansed, that I might be ransomed, that I might be redeemed. That I might be redeemed by this one and self-same God who judges the sinner, who judges the Christ rejecter, that I am declared righteous in his sight because of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Christ has shed his precious blood and I have received and believed solely, only, totally, uniquely and completely, utterly upon the blood of Christ and on that alone I know that I am forgiven. And the man and the woman also who are trusting in Christ are forgiven also and cleansed from all of their sin. God declares the man in Christ uh, righteous. God declares the woman in Christ righteous. God, he says, we are not guilty. Not guilty of all of our sin. Notice this selfsame God of heaven, who also came in the person of his son to bleed and die on Calvary's tree, at Golgotha, the place of the skull, cried, it is finished. And the precious blood of Christ, whom Peter hath spoken about in our reading, was poured out from Emmanuel's veins, being poured out. There the crimson tide flowed, that guilty, vile, hell-deserving sinners like me, like you, might be saved. Might be saved. Listen to what George Whitfield says even about the very keeping power of God to the believer. The very keeping power of God. The very grace of God on the believer. Listen to what George Whitfield says. Although believers by nature are far from God. Notice, although believers by nature are far from God and children of wrath even as others. Yet it is amazing to think how nigh they are brought to him again by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, we fail him, don't we? How true is it that even this, this failing flesh, this failing flesh of this believer, which is as rotten as the sinner's natural disposition in Adam. What I mean is your flesh and my flesh knows no difference than the flesh of the man and the woman who are unsaved and in the world. The only thing that's keeping you is the power of God, the grace of God. For your sin will be the same as their sin because your flesh is the same as their flesh. The difference is we have been washed. We have been bought with a price, with the precious blood of Christ, and we are forgiven. And we find when we sin and we fall before God, not an open course of sin, mind you. When we sin and we fall before God, our sin is the same as the natural disposition that a sinner finds himself in Adam. That his very nature is depraved, his very nature is fallen, and in his very nature he cannot, she cannot save themselves. You and I could never save ourselves. Thank God for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice this, I'm me. I'm the one who's like the man out there. Only I am redeemed. My body has been bought. And one day Christ will return in the clouds and he will change this vile body to be fashioned like onto his own glorious body. There'll be no more temptation. There'll be no more weaknesses. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more fleshy carnality nor sin that tries to draw even the very believer away for the, the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And no more will it be that we will feel the Lord for we shall be like him. We shall be like him. The Holy Spirit within the believer, within me. If you're a believer within you, the Holy Spirit will answer to the blood of Jesus Christ. I love it when the hymn writer wrote, the spirit answers to the blood. The spirit answers to the blood. The spirit answers to the blood and tells me, I am born of God. Brothers and sisters, if you're washed in the blood, 
if you're saved and washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit who lives in you, he will answer to the blood and he will tell you, you're a child of God. You're born of God and you belong to Christ. Notice, the Holy Spirit will answer to the blood of Jesus Christ and it cries, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. I am Christ's. I am a child of God. I am unworthy, yet made worthy. And when my flesh and heart condemns me, the Spirit of God reproves me and then reminds me that I am redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Brothers and sisters, do you realize that? Brothers and sisters, do you realize that? I preach the precious blood of Christ in a world who no longer wants to know the precious blood of Christ. There are many other people preaching it, not just me, but it's a, it's a growing trend and brings man into his salvation. It brings something else to add to salvation. We don't need to preach the precious blood. Friend, we need it preached morning, noon, and night. We need it preached from every mountaintop and every valley low. We need the precious blood of Christ to be preached to every heart and into every life, into every situation, and into every family. We need the precious blood for over your marriage, over your home, in your soul. You need the precious blood of Christ to be reminded of it every moment of the day and every second and every hour. The precious blood of Christ. The precious blood of Christ. I preach the precious blood of Christ to myself. I preach the precious blood of Christ to me every day. I'm going to say it again. I preach to self the precious blood of Christ every day. Why? Because my heart would condemn me until I remember the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, until I claim again the precious blood, until I remember it was a one-time, once-for-all sacrifice that will never be repeated, and it still speaks in glory this very moment, and I'm covered in the blood. I preach the blood to self every day, numerous times a day. You're washed in the blood, can. You're washed in the blood. Ronnie, you're washed in the blood. Ryan, you're washed in the blood. Laura, you're washed in the blood. You're washed in the blood. Come on, believe you're washed. You're washed in the blood. You might feel him. Uh, oh, get over it and get on with it and claim the precious blood. You're washed in the blood of the Lamb, the precious blood of Christ. I preach it to me when I get up. I preach it to me myself. Preach it to me when I'm lying in my bed at night and I can't sleep. And the old enemy would want to play with your heart and your mind and want to take you somewhere in your mind that you get angry at the wrong people or, or you think the wrong thoughts or, or you get bitterness in your heart or you get fearful of enemy attack or death that looms upon you and you say, I'm washed in the blood. I'm washed in the blood. Preach to self, the blood believer. You're a preacher, start preaching the blood to yourself. Start preaching the blood to your family. Start preaching the blood to your work colleagues. Listen, I preach the precious blood of Christ to self. I preach the precious blood to the saints. That's to you. I'm preaching it tonight. Well, what do we need to hear it for? You know, we're coming here and we're all believers or maybe we're not all believers, but I'm a believer. Most of us are nearly all believers and, and, and sure, we're all saints. We're all made righteous in the blood of Christ. We're all saints. Why do we need to know the blood? Why do you preach the blood? Surely it's for the unconverted. I'm telling you, I preach the blood to every saint. You know why? Because the devil condemns self and he condemns the saint. And you need to hear it because sometimes you forget it. Sometimes you forget the blood of the Lamb. Sometimes you forget the power of the blood. You forget the blood. So I preach to self and I preach to saints. You preach to self when you go home. You get up in the morning, you say, I'm covered in the blood. 
I'm washed in the blood. I'm under the blood. And whenever you're seeing a weekly saint, you say, listen, brother, listen, sister, or someone who's failed God, don't go and tell your work colleagues about it. And don't go and run them down to other Christians. Go and tell them, uh, what about the blood? You're washed in the blood. Remind them of the blood. The saints need to hear of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I preach to self, I preach to saints, and I preach to the sinner. I preach to the sinner, the precious blood of Christ. Well, look, I preach to self because my heart would condemn me. I preach to the saint because the devil would condemn them. And I preach to the sinner because you're already condemned. Because you're already condemned. Listen, John chapter 3, verse 16 onward. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, we love that, don't we? Listen, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth in him is not what is it? Condemned. He that believeth in him is not. Condemned. Come on, church, shout out. He that believeth in him is not. Amen. Condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Sinner, you're already under condemnation. I don't need to do it. But we're showing you the remedy tonight. It's called the precious blood of Christ. Preach the sinner because my heart would condemn me. I'll preach to the saint because the devil will condemn you. And I'll preach to the sinner. Why? Because you're already under condemnation. You're already condemned. How can we do without the precious blood of Christ? Notice the precious blood of Christ. Preach it. I'm not a preacher. Listen, you know what a preacher is? Someone that just heralds. Someone at Herald's here and you're in work. Listen, Jesus is coming. Look what's happening in the world today. How many times have I stood in this platform and others years before and talked about Russia and Iran with China and, 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 and all the things that would happen, the alliance is coming. How many times have I told, and people have laughed at me, you know. And it's happening before our eyes. Preached it just a few months ago. You must be ready because these are the signs of the times of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice, uh, we, we need to preach it. You need to, you need to be a herald. Yes. It's like someone shouting uh, out in the street, a watchman or a watchwoman, and they're going by a house and they see a house on fire. Fire, fire, fire. That's what it means. Shouting fire, there's fire. Warn the people, there's fire. Well, you know what you're doing? You're warning them, there's fire. There's fire, there's fire. It's called a lake of fire. We must warn the people, be a herald and preach the precious blood of Christ. You must pray the precious blood of Christ. Pray it over your home. Pray for your family. Claim the merit, the efficacy of the precious blood of Christ. Pray it, brother. Pray it, sister. There's too many prayers where it's the bless me club. What about thanking him for his blood? What about praising him for his precious blood? What about worshipping Jesus? Thank you for your blood, Lord. Thank you. It's outdated and it's antiquated. It's never going to lose its power, brother. It'll never lose its power, sister. It eternally speaks in glory. It's the blood of the Lamb. And men are trying to throw it out of pulpits. They'll stand before God. They'll stand before God. Preach the precious blood. Pray the precious blood. Proclaim the precious blood. Ponder on the precious blood. Think about it. Oh, thank you, Jesus. See, when I think of my life, see, when I think of who I was, do you think, of, see, when I think of what I became and what I'd done and the dangers I was in, see, when I think about it, I, 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 I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed of it. Oh, the shame, and I wasn't even ashamed before God. I'm just ashamed of self. But if I was to stand before God, oh, the shame on my face. But I don't have to because of the precious blood of Christ. 
and neither do you because of the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ponder on it, what it's done for you. Ponder on it, sister. Every morning when you get up, think about the blood. Read the scriptures on the blood. Get it out in the afternoon, the Bible, and read about the blood and pray about the blood. Thank God for the blood. I'm going to keep saying it. It's the blood. It's the blood. It's the blood. It's the blood of the Lamb. Brothers and sisters, I can't get enough of it. Yet one single drop is enough to cleanse the vilest of sinners because there's power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. In the blood of the Lamb. Preach it, pray it, proclaim it, ponder it. Listen, possess it. Yes. Come on, it's yours. Own it. He shed it for me. He did it for me. Yes. He went to the cross for me. It flowed from his veins for me. Yes. Christ's blood was for me. The precious blood of Christ, it was for me. Possess it as your own. Listen, sing about it, speak about it, shout about it, claim it, own it, believe it, because there's nothing like it, because there's nothing like it. The precious blood of Christ, we are redeemed by it. We are ransomed by the precious blood of Christ, ransomed from going down to the pit, redeemed from being our lost and helpless estate. Reconciled back to God through the precious blood of Christ. Declared righteous, not guilty. Justified through the precious blood of Christ. And we have remission of sin through the precious blood of Christ. Listen to the old Puritan Stephen Charnock. He says, let us look upon a crucified Christ. The remedy of all our miseries. His cross hath procured a crown. His passion hath expiated our transgressions. His death hath disarmed the law. His blood hath washed a believer's soul. His death is the destruction of our enemies, the spring of our happiness, and the eternal testimony of divine love. The cross is God's eternal testimony of divine love for his own. Listen to Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Atonement by the blood of Jesus is not an arm of Christian faith. Now listen. Atonement by the blood of Jesus is not an arm of Christian truth. It is the heart of it. We'll mention the blood and add it on a little bit. I'll keep, I'll keep us evangelical. We'll mention the blood and I'll keep maybe those fundamentalists. I'll keep them maybe happy. It makes me sound good. We'll just mention just a little bit about the blood of Christ. Brothers and sisters, the blood of Christ is the heart of the gospel. It's the heart of it. The precious blood of Christ is the eternal testimony of divine love. And so therefore it will always forever be marked in glory. That's the heart of Christian truth. And since the precious blood is all things and so much more, how can we deny our lips the privilege of praising God for it? I want you to get this. I want you to hear it because I want you to think about it. How can we deny our lips the privilege of praising God for it? How we can, how we can hope withhold our tongues from speaking well of it? And how can we retain our hearts from being overcome with the wonder and the glory of it? How could we? Why should we? How dare we? How dare we? In our reading, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, Peter writes, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. I want to show you four quick points. 
about the precious blood of Christ. First of all, it is personal. The precious blood is personal. Would you say personal? Yes. It's personal. Let's look at this. First John chapter 1 and verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Notice, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Not you and I have fellowship. We have fellowship with God. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, God's son, cleanseth us from all sin. It's personal to God. I want you to hear it. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is personal to the Father. It's personal to God the Father simply because it's his son's blood. Now you parent, if it was your child come in with a bloody nose, you'd be upset about it. The father sent his son, watched him bleed and die, and shed his most precious blood. It's personal to the father. It's personal to him. Listen, Matthew 26, verse 28. The Lord Jesus is instituting what we call the Lord's Supper that night. When he would take the bread and break it, it says, he says, And this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So the blood is personal to the Father because it's his Son's blood. It's personal to the Son because he says, This is my blood. This is my blood. That's not, I mentioned this some months ago or weeks ago. I don't know when it was, but if someone comes up and bloodied your nose, the blood's running out of your nose. It's personal to you. How dare they? How dare they? How dare they bleed your nose? That's my blood. Now think about this. The blood was shed from the body of Christ. It's personal to him. How dare they? It's personal to the Father. It's personal to the Son. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 12. Notice what it says. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Jesus would sanctify. It means he would mark them out with the blood. You know what this takes us back to? Exodus chapter 12, and Israel were coming out of Egypt and God was passing through in judgment. God says, take a lamb, a sinless, spotless lamb, and take the blood and put it in a basin, and take his up and put it upon the doorposts, and put it upon the door lentils, he says, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. You see, he sanctified us. It means he has marked us like the doorposts that Israel were under with the blood upon those doorposts. And when the Father looks at us in the day of judgment, we're sanctified by the blood of the Lamb. He's Christ, our Passover, who was sacrificed for us. Oh, the precious blood of Christ. Yes. What the Lord says in Exodus 12, he says, I think it's about verse 13, he says, the blood shall be like a token unto you. You know what the word token means? Like a beacon, like a flag, like a flag. You know what? There's the flag of the blood is all over me. The flag of the blood is all over you, believer. That's why we need to preach it. We need to show it. We need to tell it. We need to teach it. We need to shout it. We need to sing it. We need it. We need it. We need it. For when the Father looks at us, he sees the blood, the blood of Christ. Like a flag that's flying, he says, they are mine and I will pass over you. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, we're told, feed the church of God. Notice this. Notice the language. Feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. See, this blood wasn't just the blood of a man. <laughs> Although he was perfect, spotless lamb, it wasn't just the blood of the man because his DNA 
within him. Not a man with God dropped into him. Not like a man like you, Ian, where God the Holy Spirit has come into you and into me and other believers. No, no. Right throughout him, entwined and, and unified within him, within that body, was Almighty God. It's the blood of God. God's blood. It's personal to God. I need you to think about this because you're, there's some people that are thinking either we don't need to preach the blood. It's personal to God. Well, we don't need to know about the blood of Christ. It's personal to the Son. It's personal to the Father. And listen, it's also personal to the Holy Ghost. And people say, they know, we can get there by our works and by our alms and by our deeds or by our churchianity or our religious uh, religiosity or whatever way we can get there. Listen, friend, if you can get there, then this personal blood need not have been shed. I know I'm outdated by the world. And I know I'm being antiquated in a lot of the church world. This message doesn't stand in their churches, many of them anymore, but I can tell you one thing, this message will stand forever. This will forever ring the bell of heaven. Secondly, moving quickly, moving quickly. Let me just say before we go, see the word there, feed the church of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. See, see the word purchased? Pepper primorio, I think is how you, you pronounce it. This is what it gives you the idea of. It means to purchase, to keep, to hold, to bring unto oneself. Secondly, it's powerful. Colossians 1 and 14 says, In whom, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. It's powerful in the sense that there's nothing can forgive you of your sins. There's no way to rid yourself of your sin. No works, nor alms, nor deeds, no good living, no churches, nothing. No sacraments can rid you of your sin and redeem you back to your heavenly Father. But the precious blood of Christ. The blood is powerful. It's powerful. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20 says, Having made peace through the blood of his cross to him to reconcile all things unto himself. Notice, we are found forgiveness through the power of the blood. Now we have peace and we have reconciliation through the power of the blood when none other could join us. The blood would join us. Hebrews 9 and verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hear the eternal God. In the person of Christ, I told you the blood is personal to the Holy Ghost. Here the Holy Ghost witnesses the cross, the cross work and the finished work of Jesus. Here the Holy Spirit sees the blood and it's marked for glory. And it takes us from dead works. And it takes us from a lifeless conscience. And it takes us and turns us to serve the living God. Him. Why do you serve him? Because you have to. Because he's a terrible God. Because he's a hard taskmaster. Because he's an austere man that the man said in the parable. No, never. Not at all. I serve him because I love him. Because I love him. And the longer you serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that you love him, the more love he bestows. I'm going to start singing again. I better move on. Your ears couldn't take much more of my singing. No more works and no more sacrifice. The power of the precious blood of Christ does it all. The power of the precious blood of Christ enables us, because it's so powerful, to defeat the devil. Isn't that wonderful? Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11 speaks of those who are under the blood. It says they overcame him, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, <laughs> by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. Listen, you don't have a testimony if you're not under the blood. You don't have a testimony if you're not under the blood. 
And under the blood of the Lamb, we have a testimony of the saving grace of God found in our Lord Jesus Christ. We overcome the devil through the power of the blood. And listen to this, Job chapter 25 and verse 4 says, How then can a man be justified with God? How can you be declared righteous? Not guilty. Just as if they'd never sinned. How can a man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? In other words, when you're born, even in your mother's womb, you're a little sinner. <laughs> you know, sinning doesn't make you a sinner. Sinning doesn't make you a sinner. You see, you sin because you are one. Yes. You're already a sinner. It's like letting a, a, a car up the top of a hill, looking down the gradient and you take it out of gear and let the hand break off. Where does it do? It doesn't roll back up and put it on again, does it? No, it rolls down the hill. It's the natural declension through the gravity that will pull it down. Such is man from his mother's womb. Such is woman from their mother's womb. It's their natural declension to fall into sin because it's already in their heart to do so. Notice, how can a man be justified with God or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Simple. We know the remedy, it's through the precious blood of Christ. The power of the blood is sang about in Revelation 1 and 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Brothers and sisters, I'm hoping tonight by the time we're finished this, you're going to go home with nothing but the blood in your mind, in your heart. By the time you go home and see the next person that tries to demigrate and downgrade the precious blood of Christ, uh, you'll be able to stand and look him eyeball the eyeball and tell him about the blood. Tell him about the blood. Thirdly, and quickly, it's precious. Psalm 49, Psalm 49, verse 6. Listen to what the psalmist says. If they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, verse 7, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, verse 8, for the redemption of their soul is precious, and it seats us forever. <laughs> Notice this. We have in this uh, three verses, Verses 6, 7, and 8, we have the words redeem, ransom, and redemption. Redeem, ransom, and redemption. And the redemption of their soul is precious. The word precious is the word yacher. Yacher. And it means just like you and I would think of something being precious, that means costly, something valuable. But it also gives the idea of something that is honored, highly esteemed. Honored, highly esteemed. And here the psalmist tells us that a soul for redemption is precious. It takes a lot to redeem a soul. But I want you to catch this because the word here, yacher, just doesn't mean that. It gives the idea of weighing something in a scale. So it gives the idea of if you have scales and they're on the balances and on one side you put the soul of a man, the soul of a woman on one side and you take that other side of the scale and you weigh everything, the riches, and the precious stones, the gold, the jewels. You take all the oils and the bank bonds and all the things that men are fighting over and you keep heaping it on the other side of the scale. Will it balance come up? Will it balance that soul to redeem it? It means the scales are still weighed down on the one side. Gives the idea that the soul is too weighty for man or man to be able to ransom and redeem it. When we get the Peter says that we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. In 1 Peter 1 and 19, it's the same idea, only it is in the Greek, it's the word timios. It's the same word idea as yachar. It means valuable, costly, but it gives the idea that because the blood of Christ is so precious, because it's the blood of God, 
It's the blood of his son because it's personal to God, it's personal to the Son, it's personal to the Father, it's personal to the Holy Ghost because this blood is so precious. When it is wed in the balance to the soul in need, it outweighs the soul of every man and woman who will come unto God through Christ. You place the whole lot of us on that side of the scale and guess what? The blood of Christ is more precious it tips the scale of ours. It tips it over that we're saved, that we're cleansed, that we're washed, that we're forgiven. Brothers and sisters, it is highly esteemed because it's personal to God. So the precious blood of Christ is highly honored. It's personal blood, it's powerful blood, precious blood. Last one is pure. Listen, 1 Peter 1 and 19 says we are redeemed with cor- the, not with corruptible things. Notice verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's pure. Pure without blemish and without spot. Pilate said of the Lord Jesus Christ in John 9, 19 and 4, I find no fault in him. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 24, his wife said, have nothing to do with this just person. And pardon me, in Matthew 27 and verse 24, it said that, he says, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. First John chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin. Hebrews 4 and verse 15 says, He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, For he made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 1 Peter 2 and 22 says, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Hebrews 7 and verse 26 says, Christ is holy, harmless, undefined, and separate from sinners. And the centurion in Luke 23 and verse 47 said, certainly this was a righteous man. The blood of Christ was pure. It doesn't come through Joseph, by the way. It came straight from the Holy Ghost. It came straight from God. So I finish with this. Thank you for your attention. The blood of Christ, the precious blood of Christ is personal, powerful, precious, and it's pure. Now listen, Leviticus 17 and verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. Do you know the blood is mentioned in the Bible, the King James, 447 times in 357 verses? The blood, when it refers directly or symbolically to the blood of Christ, shows us the very heart and the very core of our Bible, the very true foundation of our Christian faith and heritage. The blood of Jesus is the one and only means, method, and manner by which a soul can be saved, cleansed, redeemed, Forgiven, purchased, ransomed. The precious blood of Christ is powerful and pure and personal. The blood of Christ is the gospel. The blood of Christ is the good news. And listen, close him with this. You ready? I've written this and I mean this. Any departure from the biblical message of redemption through the blood is heresy. And any belittling or diminishing the message of the teaching of the precious blood of Christ is apostasy. It must be avoided at all cost. It is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. If you drain... The body, from its, the, blood, the body from all its blood, it dies and all things left behind is dead and lifeless. Just a corpse, a shell. 
If you drain the the blood out of the body of Christ, the mystical body, the church, if you drain the blood out of the body of Christ, it too will die and become a corpse. Just a mere shell and shadow of what it is and should be. If you take the blood out of the Bible, the preaching of the blood, the teaching of the blood, the witnessing of the blood, the gospel of blood, you'll have a lifeless book. You'll have a powerless preacher in the pulpit. You'll have a meaningless message and messenger. And you'll have false conversions to a known effect of gospel because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Brothers and sisters, we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Don't you let anybody tell you any different. Preach to you any different. You can't get enough of the preaching of the blood of the Lamb. May Christ take his word to us tonight and to all of our hearts. To those who are here, we know we're aware there are people listen live. And later, last week, Sunday morning message was listened to or watched, I should say, near 6,000 times. And we don't know how many will hear it. I want them to hear it. If we're in a place where they're diminishing the power of the blood, get out. Get out. And go to where the blood is preached. For it's all in the blood of the Lamb. May God bless his word to all of our hearts this evening. Amen.